it's over, right? Pretty much. I know there are variants and it can come back, but we're mostly winding down, which I mean, obviously that's great. That's what we want, obviously. It's really good news. And yet it's weird for me to say that part of me is gonna miss it. I mean, obviously that's weird to say. I know it's weird, but I'm not talking about the illness part or the death part, obviously. I'm not a monster, despite what some people seem to think. When I say I'm gonna miss COVID, I'm talking about the camaraderie, which maybe sounds silly since we're all hunkered down by ourselves, but we could still get online and find people and commiserate about the protocols and the solitude. And we could all participate in the conversation. Hey, we're all in this together, which I really liked feeling included because that's something that I've always struggled with. I guess all the way back to grade school and kickball and whenever you could be excluded, I would be. And it wasn't just because kids are mean, which they are. A lot of it was just, I apparently have a personality that can be difficult to like, I've been told. But on the computer, it's easier for me to curate what I put into a space, if that makes sense, which is maybe why I find this easier than real life interactions. Anyway, before the pandemic, I had this group of friends or Co-workers, actually, I, I was still trying to get to the friend level, if I'm being honest, and we all worked together at the Apple store. And a lot of them were from New York, which I'm not. So they were actually here when 9-11 happened, and they would often talk about what it was like on that day, how awful it was. And, and whenever they talked about it, I just felt kind of left out, I guess, because I was still living in Duluth on 9-11. I mean, obviously, I saw it on television. I mean, not that I wished that I'd been here because obviously that would have been, you know, traumatizing. But they all had this deep connection to this thing that I didn't have. So I always felt outside of their circle. And there's this one woman, especially Mackenzie. And whenever 9-11 came up, she was always like, oh my gosh, my high school is right there. We had to evacuate and run for our lives. Like every time. Someone mentioned 9-11. She had to tell that story about how she was running and crying and tried to call her parents, but her phone was dead. So some old lady let her, let her use her phone and then they walked over the Brooklyn Bridge together and they've been in touch ever since. Which is nice, obviously. But Mackenzie told that story so many times and people were always like, oh my gosh, she must have been so scared. And Mackenzie obviously loved the attention, which, you know, is kind of creepy to me. But also maybe I shouldn't judge people so much, which is something I do, I don't Anyway, this guy, Leon, who was a manager at the Apple store, he threw a party in Astoria once. And I, I'm not positive he meant to invite me because I kind of walked into the break room as he was telling people about it. And he didn't see me there, but I asked for the address anyway, because so he kind of had to invite me. And I went and we we're all there on his roof and it was pretty cold because it was March, but I didn't complain because I'm from Duluth. In fact, I was having a fairly successful conversation with a guy who was originally from Mankato. So we both had this Minnesota pride about tolerating low temperatures. But then this group of people next to us started talking about the view from the roof and I could see the Manhattan skyline. And, and then the Mankato guy kind of shifted away from me and melted into that circle. And I've experienced that before. People silently drifting away from me. But then... My came up. So of course, Mackenzie started in with her stupid monologue, which I really didn't want to hear again. So right in the middle of it, I said, okay, Mackenzie, we get it. You saw the towers fall. Good for you. And I meant for it to sound jokey, but it really didn't come out as jokey because maybe I was drunker than I realized. So it just kind of sounded loud and mean, I guess. And everyone was staring at me. And then Leon said, what the F, Barry? Except he didn't say what the F. He said the actual F word. So I immediately regretted the outburst. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm just a little sensitive about this topic because my dad died on 9-11, which is true actually. He really did die on 9-11, but it's not something I generally talk about. And all their faces changed after I said that, especially the guy from Mankato. And they all look kind of concerned and sympathetic, which felt really nice actually. And their little circle opened like they were making room for me. So I stepped into it. 
And then Mackenzie said, Barry, I'm so sorry. I had no idea. Well, your dad was he in one of the towers. I said, no, he was not in the towers. And then someone said, is he in one of the planes? I said, no, not in the planes. And then they started to look a little confused. And I had to explain to them that, yes, my dad did die on 9-11, but he was in Duluth at the time and he had liver cancer. Which you'd st still think they'd be sympathetic because cancer, but they didn't see it that way. In fact, Mackenzie was like, what's wrong with you, Barry? You can't say your father died on 9-11 if he was in Duluth. And I said, but that was the date, Mackenzie. He died on 9-11. It still counts. But I kind of yelled it. And I also might have been a little weepy. So everyone got quiet. And I didn't know what to do. So I just looked at the edge of the roof and I said, should I just jump? And I did a little chuckle so everyone would know that I was joking and trying to cut the tension. But the chuckle sounded really weird because I'm not good at fake chuckles. So then it just made everything more tense. And then the guy from Mankato said, I'm kind of cold, so I'm going inside, which I knew was a lie because he's from Mankato, but I didn't want to say anything because I didn't want to make things worse. But then I did anyway, because I can't help myself. And then I just yelled, you're not cold, you liar. You're from Mankato. So then he kind of picked up and he hurried inside and a bunch of people hurried in after him. And it was, then it was just me and Leon on the roof. And I wanted to thank him for inviting me, but I didn't do that. Instead, I said, well, see you at work, chief. And then I headed out while doing a funny John Cleese walk, which admittedly was extra nuts. But at that point, why not? Needless to say, it was a little weird at the Apple store after that. But then we went into lockdown, which obviously came as a huge relief. But that's all over now. It's okay, though. I've had a lot of time to reflect. And I think I can do better at interacting. For one thing, we all went into the pandemic. It was a shared experience that we can all talk about. No one gets left out. And I'm thinking about calling Mackenzie. I think I owe her an apology. The 24-hour plays is an artistic home for me. The team has really believed in me ever since I was a director in the life-changing nationals program. And every time they ask me to come back since then, I'm just more and more grateful to be a part of this family. I'm not enough to carry this 24-hour plays phenomenon on my tiny shoulder. So that's why we need your help to keep it going. The 24-hour plays raises up audiences, artists, and this year for me personally, they really reminded me that the show does indeed go on.